In modern air combat, it's easy to get overwhelmed with information. With everything that gets thrown at a pilot, it's not hard to lose track of your location. Or the location of allies and the people trying to kill them. So how do you keep up with everyone's location? And how do you convey that information quickly and concisely? The US military uses bullseye and geographic references for this. So let's go over what those are and how they work. As long as there have been air forces going to war in large numbers, there's been a need to get them coordinated. Getting help when you need it or warning allies of a threat are both things that need to happen fast. It wasn't long before air forces found that vague requests didn't help. Saying there are enemy fighters on me doesn't help if no one knows where you're at. The simple solution for this was to agree to a common reference points ahead of time for everyone involved in a mission. Now someone could say there are enemy fighters 10 miles north of the reference points. Then everyone who hears the message would know exactly where that is. Using a very prominent landmark like a mountain or a city makes this a lot easier for everyone involved. That way they can just look out of the canopy and see it. No special technology is needed for a reference point you can see with your own eyes. During the Vietnam War, the city of Hanoi and its surroundings were often the target of U.S. airstrikes, so it became the common reference point. And so it quickly earned the name of bullseye among air crews. When enemy fighters or air defenses were spotted, they could be quickly located in reference to the city. A large city on a river is easily identifiable. So when a bomber crew announced enemy interceptors were located on a bearing of 270, 15 miles from Bullseye, it was very easy for every friendly fighter in the area to converge on that location. They could just visually locate Hanoi and then look to the west. And all this was done with a single radio call from the bomber. Each individual fighter did not need its own personalized talk on. This was such an effective tactic that it was reused in Desert Storm, where the city of Baghdad became Bullseye. And now it's codified in doctrine for all U.S. services. Here's how it's described. Bullseye is an established reference point from which the position of an object can be referred to by bearing and range. And the way that it works is that a contact can be described as being at the following location. This would be read as 22530. You might hear some people read that as 225430. But adding that 4 in there could lead to confusion since 4 sounds like the number 4. So stay away from this habit. Now there are a couple special rules to remember besides this one. If a contact is within 5 nautical miles, it can be described as at bullseye. So if you're a part of a flight named Showtime 11, then you might hear a call that sounds like this. Showtime 11, lead group, at bullseye, 39,000, track north, hostile. Now you and everyone on the radio know a hostile group is flying north over the bullseye at 39,000 feet of altitude. It's all very fast and efficient. Bullseye can also be given a code name in special circumstances. So let's say it was code named Rock. You might hear the following. Mike, South Group, Rock, 25529, 39,000, Cap, Hostile. That lets us know a group of hostile aircraft are flying a combat air patrol orbit at 39,000 feet at a location 29 miles west of Bullseye. One last rule to remember with Bullseye is this. Bullseye will not be truncated to bull to avoid it being misinterpreted as bra. Okay, so you might be asking, what is bra? It's another way to communicate a location to an aircrew. It stands for bearing, range, altitude, and aspect, and it's exactly what it sounds like. This would be an informative message indicating the magnetic bearing to a target, its range in nautical miles, altitude, and aspect. Aspect is going to be a descriptive word telling us which way the target is facing relative to you. Here's how that is visualized. If you were piloting a fighter here, then you would be in the target's hot aspect. This would be the beam aspect. These two aspects have some overlap, so you might hear either cold or drag. In other words, the target is dragging you behind it. One thing to remember about bra calls is that they are specific to one aircraft. So in this example, the target is at a magnetic bearing of 360 from this fighter. But it would be at 040 for this one, and 290 for this one. So if a controller wanted to pass on the target's location to all three, then three separate bra calls would be needed. That's why bullseye is the primary method. Only one radio call has to be made to get everyone on the same page. But there are some special situations where a bra call is mandatory. If the information is only for one aircraft, 
or as a direct response to these requests. BRA is simply a request for directions to a specific air contact in BRA format. Bogeydope is a request for information on indicated or closest group in BRA format. The other time when a BRA format is used is when a controller is reporting a threat. This happens whenever an untargeted hostile or bandit or bogey is within a brief range of a friendly aircraft. And it would sound like this. Showtime 1-1, lead group, threat BRA 27055, 39000, flank northeast, hostile. Now Showtime 1-1 knows there is a threat directly west, 55 miles away. It's flying northeast and showing its flank. The controller is also letting Showtime 1-1 know that it has been confirmed as hostile. And since this information is directly relevant to Showtime 1-1, the BRA format is used instead of bullseye. There's one last type of reference we need to cover, and that's the geographic reference, or GeoRef for short. Georefs may be a prominent natural feature, such as a mountain peak, or a prominent man-made structure, such as an airfield. Georefs work exactly like bullseye. The only difference is they are some other point besides the agreed-upon bullseye. These locations are important because a lot of times friendly aircraft may not be near bullseye. So another easy-to-find reference is needed to help with coordination over a wider area. A good example of this are the farms near the town of Rachel in Nevada. This is in the training range used for USAF red flag exercises. The desert in this area doesn't offer much in the way of easily identifiable landmarks. But these big green circles stick out. So they're known as the farm, and you could give bullseye format calls using farm as the GeoRef. In the last video, we looked at this map of the cap and tanker orbits used in Operation Allied Force. We can see several of these points with unique names. These are real-life examples of GeoRefs. This one named Bat is the city of Belgrade. And this one called Derringer is the city of Pristina. Both are very distinct landmarks. Prominent mountain peaks, man-made harbors, and distinctive lakes are all potential GeoRefs. So it's a good idea for pilots to learn them and use them. In fact, a good practice among pilots is to do a familiarization flight in an area of operations. This not only helps in memorizing the GeoRefs, but it helps to prevent getting lost, too. Here are some examples from the Caucasus and DCS. When flying over central Georgia, you can tell you're near the city of Gori by these landmarks. There's a large lake here, a small lake next to it, then a city on the river. It's distinctive enough that you can be sure you're not looking at some other town. On the Black Sea coastline, you'll find this uniquely shaped lake. This is Lake Paleostomi, and if you see it, then you know there are several air bases nearby. Further south near the coast is this X-shaped inactive airfield. If you see this, then you know that you're less than 20 miles from Georgia's southern border with Turkey and another airfield. Mount Elbrus is another good choice for a GRF since it's the highest peak in the region. This is what it looks like from 40 miles away. It's clearly visible even from this distance. In fact, it's even easier to notice when there's overcast, since it reaches up to over 18,000 feet. Mount Elbrus also sits only a few miles from the border between Georgia and Russia. So a pilot could use it as a visual reference to keep from flying into the other nation's airspace. Remember that air crews were using bullseye and GRFs long before GPS and digital computers were common in aircraft. You don't need a state-of-the-art fighter to use either one. It's also a good idea for pilots to get familiar with local terrain and to keep an eye on the prominent landmarks. Do this and then you too can quickly and easily find any air contacts using these techniques. Now that we have a good understanding of how air crews pass on locations, it's time to get into the basics of fighter air-to-air -air communications. That'll be the topic of the next video, and I hope you'll come back to see that one.